Hello, everybody. My name is Lim Tit Ming. I am the CEO of Science Center Singapore. Uh, it is my privilege to moderate this plenary lecture by our Nobel laureate, Professor Didier Kelo, who won the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the first exoplanet, 51 Pegasi B. And it was really a paradigm shift. Initially, people didn't believe in such a thing, so he had to work very hard to convince people that indeed it is an exoplanet. And since then, more than 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered, and many of whom, of which have been discovered by Professor Kalo himself. Exactly how many, you may have to ask him, out of the 4,000, how many he discovered. But it's now my pleasure and my honor to present to you Professor Didier Kello to tell you more about the exoplanet revolution. So, Professor Didier Kello, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. So, I will be talking to you about what I do call, and we do call, essentially the exoplanet revolution. Why is it a revolution? Next slide, please. Is just the, the growth of discovery has been tremendous in the last 25 years. You see here from 1995, when we announced the first discovery of a planet orbiting another star, an exoplanet, until now, we're reaching a very impressive amount of identify and confirm exoplanets. So here, the color that you see, I mean, reflects two essentially two or maybe three main technology, but essentially two technology that being used to detect this planet. We don't see this planet. We just see the effect of this planet on the star, either by moving the star. This is called the radial velocity techniques. We get the mass of the planet from this, the period and the shape of the orbit, or by seeing the planet uh, going in front of its star. It's called a transit. By this, we get the size of the planet and the period as well. So essentially, a lot of discovery has happened. You see dramatic growth. They are related to essentially new equipment, space developments, one of the very famous space satellites being Kepler. And that's why you have this increase of discoveries. So this is why it's revolutions. But what does it mean for our solar system? Next slide, please. We have a built a very detailed understanding on the origin of the solar system, essentially by looking at our own planets. Um, it's very incomplete because it's only one example amongst many. And for a long time, people have been looking to find similar planets on other stars. Well, it turns out to be a surprise because the planet that we have found were not exactly the same that all planet of our system. Next slide, please. If you break apart the giant planet, you will find that inside there are what we call a core. We know that because we have an idea of the density of these planets, and we have also an idea of the inside interior of this planet by very close flyby and detecting slight deviation of the gravity field of these systems. We know that there are core of, let's call solid material, and all the rest is a gas. It's the same gas that you have in the sun. It's hydrogen and maybe a bit of helium here. And these are the main compositions of these planets. Because of this, we have a good picture of how this planet may have been formed. It's not obvious when you look at the diversity of this planet to find a single way to form the systems. And it took quite a lot of time for people to understand this. Next slide, please. The first clue we have is just by looking at our own system. Next slide, please. This is our system. And in the middle, you see the orbit of Jupiter. This is all the object that we have identified in our um, planetary system. Well, we have the planets, but also a lot of bodies. And all these bodies, they are famous 
region called as trans-Neptunian regions, um, that is, in a sense, where we're finding the failed planet. And, and this is telling us that the planetary systems has been formed from a structure that is like a disk and by a mechanism that is bringing all this piece that you see here together. For some reason, it didn't work very well beyond some distance. That's why the last planet we have in this system, which is clear and clean, is Neptune. After we have really a quite rich population of objects, and one of the famous objects is Pluto, that was seen as a planet early on, but has been discarded for this very reason. So this is helping us to understand what is the origin of a planetary system. Now watch out the, the unit on the bottom left, 50 AU. It means 50 astronomical unit. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the earth. That's a kind of a easy unit of reference that we don't need to use miles and kilometers, all this unit that is just too complicated. Well, you get an idea of the extent of the size of the solar system here. Now we're going now to jump into the space and we're going to look at other stars. We have a very, very good example of uh, young stars with what we call a protoplanetary system. Next slide, please. The unit didn't change. We still have 50 AU and this is at the right scale. So you understand from this picture that it is a young star. Actually, the name of the star is HL Tau, and this picture is made by using many telescopes together. That is called ALMA. They're not producing a visible picture that you would detect with your eyes. This is a picture, if you observe the sky, in a very remote wavelength, which is a millimeter wavelength, which is not very far from the wavelength that your microwave is using um, to warm water in, um, in food. Um, essentially, what is here, it's a slight thermal emissions from a disk-like structure. It's slight because it's not very warm. It's certainly not as warm as the temperature we're experiencing right now. The universe is dark. It's cold. It's about three degrees absolute temperature here. What we're seeing here is about 70 degrees absolute temperature. The zero degree we're having is 260 um, uh, absolute temperature. So we're very far away from the temperature we're experiencing here uh, on, on our planet, but it's still very visible for an equipment like this. And that is essentially a trace of all the tiny particles which are emitting light and temperature. So the sun in the middle, you don't see it very well here, is eating a lot of tiny materials and this tiny material has some temperature warmer and hotter than the dark universe and this is what you see so if you pay attention to this picture you will see there is some kind of a structure this structure is uh, some kind of a clue that a mechanism is going on here that the mechanism that we are experiencing right in front of our eyes is the formation of planet. Now, to really understand how planet forms, this picture, it's not really the best way to understand that. You have to look at the formation stage, the protoplanetary stage, from a different angle. So for that, I have to change target. I have to go to another star, which is very famous, which is called Beta Pictoris. So next slide, please. Beta Pictoris is a star where we see the disk, but in that case, it's on the edge. So we don't see it from the top. We don't see the nice disk, but you see it from the edge. So let's look at the picture on the top. The picture on the top is a picture where we have played a little bit of a trick. We have added a kind of a mask on the star, not to be blinded by the star. And we have used a wonderful telescope, which is a Hubble Space Telescope. And it's essentially something not far from the visible light. So you see a tiny line, very thin, which corresponds to all the material you have, the same kind of material that was producing the heat in the previous picture. But in this case, that's not the heat of this material. It's just a reflection. It's like the moon reflecting 
the light from the sun. So the reflection of this material is telling us where all this tiny object, tiny particle, small piece of solids material we have here are located. If you pay attention, there is also a kind of another um, um, disk that seems to be closer with a little bit of an angle. You're right, it's because there is a planet here that has been detected. And you know it's a reason why the planet is, is, is affecting the disk Similarly, that what we saw before, creating this kind of structure. Now, what is more fascinating here is to see how thin is this disk. Well, you get even a better perception if you compare with the very same image at the very same scale. But in that case, you use a complete different technology, which is a technology we had before, which is ALMA. And you look not for the solid particle or the light from the solid particle. You look for the gas. And to look for the gas, you look for the molecule of the gas. So this is ALMA again doing that. And you see on the picture on the bottom, that is the gas you have, it's a rather different structure. What is striking is first is far less elongated. It doesn't go that far. It stops at some point. And it's also much thicker. So what's going on here? Well, I think you have on the eyes in front of you the foundation of the physical mechanism that form a planet. The gas is directed, is controlled by its own density. So um, it's called hydrodynamic equilibrium or balance. And that's the reason why when you go on the top of a mountain, you can still breathe. There are still some gas. There is less gas, but there's still some gas. While if you, if you um, throw a rock, a piece of rock, it's not going to stay. It's going to fall down as, as down as they can. So the way the gas is being structured is very different. And by its more own essence, on the fact you have a pressure and you have to, what, you have to build an hydro um, 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 equilibrium or balancing between the gravity and the pressure, um, you end up with a much thicker disk. Well. What happened then is there is a point when there is no gas. Actually, the reason why there is no gas is because the temperature of the gas is decreasing along the way. The farther away you go, the cooler you become. So there is a point when the gas cannot be gas anymore. If you imagine the water as a gas, well, if you cool down the water, you are going to get snow. And that's exactly what's going on here. So any gas, it can be water, can be CO2, will have a point where they will not be gas anymore. They will become solid particles. And this change of state from gas to solid is the key to form planet. As soon as you reach the temperature that brings the gas to a solid state, the solid state is going to fall and is going to make a very thin disk. So a lot of material will collide. They will all collide together and they will all collide on the mid plane, exactly uh, on the picture on the top. Because of this collision, they will start to glue each other, and you will make the core. But the core will be big enough, the core that I showed you before on the giant planet, you will start to attract, attract with the gravity everything around. And what do you have around? In some case, you have gas. Not the same. It will be other gas. But there is plenty of gas that will never become solid because it's impossible with a given temperature to make it. It's the hydrogen and essentially the helium here. So hydrogen and helium always stay on a gaseous form. So there is plenty of them because that's the most dominant gas you have. And then you attract it and you make giant planet. This is why we have giant planet farther away in our solar system. So when 25 years ago, we detected very same planet, a giant planet, but not at that distance, but 25 times closer to the distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 5% of one AU, it was a shock. Because if there is one place where nobody was expecting a planet of that kind, it was certainly the way we announced the planet. And it took some time for people to realize that there are actually plenty of planets much closer because in this whole scenario, I'm telling you, I just forgot something essential. Well, you can form a planet at that distance, but it doesn't mean the planet will stay. 
So the planet will be moving. As soon as you form this planet, there will be a lot of interactions, dynamical interactions, first between the planets you're forming, but also between the planet and the disk. And this is the reason why we have so many planets right now which look different. Next slide. The summary of the planet we have is this picture. On the left, you have the period, the orbital period, and the radius of the planet. The blue point, it's each planet with a transit has a blue dot here on this picture. On the right, you have the period and the mass. The mass is measured by the radial velocity techniques. Some of the planets here detected have both, a transit and a mass. Some have only a mass, others have only a transit. But the picture is the same when you look at this. To understand the picture, you have to look at the known planet, Jupiter. You realize that Jupiter on the top corner is there on both. Uh, it's uh, 10 times the radius of the Earth or 300 times the mass of the Earth. This is the location of the Earth, of, the, of Jupiter. And then you see the period, which is 11 years here. You see also the Earth and Venus as well. So there is two facts that are striking on this picture. The first one, there are essentially three kind of planets that we have found. Well, 51 peg, the first of them, is on the top left bulb. It is giant planet, the size of Jupiter, or the mass of Jupiter, but very short period, a couple of days. And they are the same on the transit and the radial velocity discovery. Now, if you go on the bottom, on the small mass, on small small planet, there is a population of object that is somewhat between the Earth, mass and size, and then up to Neptune's, maybe Saturn here, and I will come back on these populations. This is a very awkward population that we have no counterpart. Um, they have been a big surprise with this with these planets here, and we are we used to call this planet because they are different from the Earth and different from from Neptune, either super Earth and mini Neptunes, and you will see why. And then we left with all the rest, which is the long period and massive planet where we find Jupiter. Uh, and then we have a kind of a, a large spread here uh, because some of them are much massive and so much farther away. Now, I need to add something on this diagram. And could you have the next slide, please? It's, there are a lot of different threshold here. We cannot find all the planets we want. And the fact that there is no planet around the Earth and Venus, on both sides, either in size by the transit or by the radial velocity because it's extremely difficult. We have been struggling right now to detect the systems. So this diagram is highly incomplete. It's not the full picture. The left side of the dividing line, hatchet line I have overlay here, is kind of a region where we are okay to detect. We're not the same sensitivity. It's easier to detect the more massive planet on short period, but we can find objects. The more you get closer to this limit, the more it becomes incomplete. So there is another level of complexity, which is not straightforward on this diagram, is trying to assess from this the likelihood that you would find a planet on a star, the rate of occurrence, or the occurrence rate, the way we call it in astrophysics. So next slide, please. And these are the numbers. If you compute how likely you have to find a planet of a specific kind you have here, Hot Jupiter is 1% to 5%. So if you have 20 or 30 stars, at least one will have a hot Jupiter. 50 to 80% of planets are found on stars with uh, the kind of uh, structure of planet within Earth and Neptune. This is a fascinating number because these planets have no counterpart in the solar system. So we already learned something here. Very profound is the solar system as it is, it's not a dominant structure. It's one of them, but that's not the dominant structure. Most of the planets being found are found in this range, much closer to the star. So it seems that what I described before, this event, which is moving the planet at the stage of the formation, is quite common. So then we can reverse the question and ask ourselves, well, we have been quite lucky not to move around. Otherwise, it will end up that way. And then we can question the question of whether life would have emerged on our system. 
And then we have between 10 to 15 percent of giant planet. There's a large uncertainty here because we don't really know when to stop the count. Um, is an object of 20 times the mass of Jupiter still a planet? Frankly, we are not sure. Um, it gets closer to what's called the stellar boundary. It's not a star. It doesn't shine like a star. You don't ignite the thermonuclear reactions with that mass. But maybe it's still like a kind of a star that has failed or failed star and that we have a category of object that we call the brown dwarf here, but I don't want to enter into this. Okay, next slide. What is interesting now is to do one step more, is to combine these two diagrams together, to bring the planet with a mass and a size. This is this picture. It's a fascinating picture because it essentially tells you the density of the planet and tells you the story, what is the planet. Well, let's start from the top. On the top, you have this kind of actual line that is crossing Jupiter and Saturn. Well, the line that I draw here is the line that you would expect if you take a planet which has the same structure than Jupiter. But I will play a trick, I will change the mass a little bit. So there is the law of physics that will change the size, and that's exactly what you would expect. Well, you notice right away that most of the planets we have found in this regime, they don't fit exactly. They are all look to be above. It means they have all a bigger size than what we expect from Jupiter. We call that inflated planet. And the reason why they inflated it, most of these planets are on very short orbit. They are mostly all hot Jupiter here. Because they're hot Jupiter, they're extremely hot. Because they're extremely hot, there is other phenomenon that start to act and it's changing a little bit the, sh the size of this planet and make them more inflated. Can be quite quite significant, it could be by a factor two, if you increase the size of the planet by a factor two, because the density goes to the cube, so at the end you end up with something which is extremely fluffy compared to Jupiter. But they still, still match with a kind of a Jupiter kind of structure. If you go down in mass, you start eating Neptunes. You see Neptune doesn't match at all the Jupiter and Saturn model. We know why, because there is much less um, hydrogen into this kind of planet. But the other um, diagram that overlay here is this blue hatched line. This is a kind of a crazy planet in a sense because it could not exist. It's a planet made only of water. So if you make a planet only with water, which we know we cannot do that because there's always a mixture, but if you make it with that mixture, you would lie along this, this kind of line. And you see there are some kind of planet that looks like a water planet. Well, if you keep moving and go down, you have the Earth as a reference. One Earth mass, one Earth size. But you can twist a little bit the same way by using the same structure, but then you increase the mass and you will build this kind of grain line. And you see there are planets along this line as well. So you realize that if you pick a mass of around 10 here in this diagram, 10 Earth mass, well, we can well end up with a planet that looks like the Earth, looks like a water planet, or looks like Neptune's. There, was, there is a wide diversity of structure. And that was a big surprise because we had to expand our understanding of the planet structure. Next slide, please. Um, in a way, we have this kind of picture right now. On one hand, we have the giant planet. We have the ice giants, the same that Neptune's. We have something in between because clearly there are planets that doesn't look like Neptune, that doesn't look like, like Saturn as well or, or Jupiter. So we have what's called the massive core soup giant. But between the ice giants and the Earth, we found a lot of diversity. We call them mini Neptune or kind of small dwarf or rocky super Earth or even a planet with a very massive oceans. And not the ocean I'm, uh, like us with few kilometers. I'm talking about an ocean of 1,000 kilometers. So this is the reality. This is what we have found out in 25 years, that planetary formations is way more creative than what we had imagined. Next slide, please. No, how are we going to make progress? Well, we need to find out something about the atmosphere of the systems. We can use a transit. This is a transit-like curve on the top. It means the change of the flux of a star when the planet orbits. So you see the transit at phase zero, and you see the time when the planet goes behind which is the secondary eclipse. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, this secondary eclipse are fascinating because that's the only moment where you only see the star. Think about that. You have a planet orbiting a star. 
then at the time the planet is behind, you don't see the planet. So that's the only moment, if you observe that star with any equipment you can think about, you will see only the star. Next slide, please. It defines a very important level, which is the flux of the star. Anything that is above it comes from the planet. And this is how we find out planet atmosphere. We use anything above. We use a shape, which is called phase functions, the same kind of phase you have with the moon. It's a reflection or the thermal effect of the planet. We can also use a transit because some part of the flux from the star is going to cross the atmosphere of the planet. By knowing the atmosphere of the planet, we get a better insight on the structure, on the structure of the planet. If you get a planet full of water, you expect a lot of water in the atmosphere. If you get a rocky planet with no atmosphere, you will get a specific shape. And this is what we're doing right now. And this is what we keep be doing in the next 20 years and understanding the systems that we have detected even better. Next slide, please. Now, there's a concept that comes with all that, which is called habitable zone. So we can find out the right region where if you have water in the planet, the water will be in liquid form. Next slide, please. The planet we have found lie in this region of this diagram. This is a distance against the mass of the, of the stars. So most of the planets are on short distance. I think you're convinced about that. So the problem we're having right now is essentially all the planets, they are too close to the stars to sustain liquid water, which is, seems to be essential for possible life on set. Now, we're doing a trick. Now, next slide, please. We're changing the mass of the stars. If you change the mass of the stars and look at smaller mass stars, the star becomes cooler then to get the same temperature, you have, you have to get closer. It's like being a fire. If you make the fire smaller, you have to get closer to the fire, not to get cold. So this many planets that we have found are interesting for the habitable zone perspective when the star is smaller. And we have been looking for this planet on small stars. And we have been quite successful. There's a very extreme object. Next slide, please. Which is a TRAPPIST system. TRAPPIST star, TRAPPIST-1 is a star which is 10 times smaller than the sun. So it means a very cool star. The, the sun has 5,700 5, degrees at the surface. Trappist has barely 2,800. It's a very cool star for a star. Now, the system is very close. It's made of seven planets. But because it's so close, all the temperature profile is being rescaled. So that's what we've been doing here. The system is very close. It, it's 5% of the distance between the Earth and the sun. But because of the rescaling of the temperature, there is at least two or three planets that are within the habitable zone. So I would like to open a last chapter of this talk by discussing a little bit what we're trying to do with that and opening the chapter, which is about life. Next slide, please. So can we find life on Trappist? Does it mean there is life? The fact that there is a planet on the habitable zone. Next slide, please. It's a very complicated question. And from the astronomy perspective, the only way we can tackle that is to look at the atmosphere of this planet and to look for some molecules. But here, I have to just warn you, it's not an easy task. If you imagine that getting water and getting oxygen will tell you the whole story, you're wrong. Because you can easily make a planet without any life, with water and oxygen uh, detected, that is related to the, uh, to the chemistry or the geology of the planet. We have a couple of examples from Vicky Meadows here that tell you the different way to create these molecules and to make this molecule in the atmosphere. So it is still difficult and we'll need a lot of studies and detailed study, but it's certainly a way to understand the complex geodynamic of these systems. Let's imagine we can do that. We can understand the geodynamics and the geochemistry of the system. What comes next? Next slide, please. Well, we asked ourselves, what does it mean getting life? So there's different approach to do that. You can head for the jackpot and trying to listen for radio ET. I don't think this is the best way to go. I think it's much more interesting to understand what is the condition for life? What are the building blocks? All life started on Earth. And there is what we call prebiotic chemistry. It's all the chemistry that has to happen before you have life. It's prebiotic, before having the biology going on. We have a, something fascinating, next slide please, is the fact that all life is built up on these 20 amino acids. These are the prebiotic ingredients that is needing to make life. Why is 20? How could you come up with this 20? There has been tremendous progress made in the last five years 
about understanding the chemistry that is leading to this amino acid. Next slide, please. Without going into too much detail, we need a couple of ingredients that trigger a massive production of these amino acids and the reference are listed if you're interested. You need water, well, you need a planet, a rocky planet. You need water, you need some kind of volcanic activity to produce a lot of SO3 available. You need HCN. HCN is pretty easy to get if you get a lot of cometary impact. There's plenty of HCN in comets. You need a kind of neutral atmosphere. You get it for free when you build a planet. It's kind of CO2 build atmosphere. And you get some energy. Energy comes from the sun. It's a UV energy to make the chemistry happen. These people here have demonstrated that there is a set of network, of chemistry network, which works at the surface of the planet if you have all these ingredients together and you produce a massive amount of amino acid. Amino acid is not life, but I think it's an interesting way to explore about the chemistry that makes life possible. If indeed this is the reason for life, then we have an interesting conditions that start to add up. We not only need water, we need maybe the right amount of UV. We need to demonstrate that there is enough material falling on the planet, cometary impact, and we need to find out whether there is SO3. These are additional elements that we may be able to find out just by looking at the planet and looking at the systems. And I think this is how we're going to make progress in the futures in this field. Next slide, please. Now, just a note of caution here. Um, when you combine this with habitable zone, it doesn't work exactly like you've planned. This is diagram that combine habitable zone in blue that depends on the temperature of the star. On the left side, there is the temperature of the star. And then the habitable zone, this is where you can find a lot of planets been detected these days. Well, the condition for this mechanism to work define a regime that is called the abiogenesis zone. You need enough of UV flux to make this chemistry going on. Otherwise, the chemistry happens, but not the way you like to produce the amino acid. This is called the dark and light chemistry here. So when you define and you compute this number, and we did that, I've been doing working with my, uh, my colleagues in Cambridge on this very specific topic, we find out that it doesn't work for low mass planets. Uh, sorry, low mass stars. Planet, uh, stars like Trappist doesn't receive enough UV flux uh, from the stars to be efficiently producing the amino acids. So if you want to build up an understanding of life on another planet, we may need to rely on our own planet as a reference. In that case, we should be careful about deviating and from the kind of star we're having, or we should be aware that some of the conditions that we may imagine for life on our own systems related to our own sun may not be applicable to these systems. And maybe the life has used a completely different set of chemistry and would be very difficult to pinpoint and to detect. And that's something we have to keep in mind. Now, there is an additional difficulty here. Next slide, please. Is when you look at a planet, the planet is not a static object. You see any kind of historical landmark uh, of the story of the planet, starting from the nebular phase on the bottom left, slowly getting to a magma oceans and having a lot of impact at the early stage. The atmosphere keeps changing at that stage. You may lose the atmosphere because of the major impact. Then after you, you, you keep having the core of the planet, which is still a bit melted, you have a lot of volcanic activity, the atmosphere keeps changing. And at some point, you start to have the life development here. And you move from a volcanic dominating atmosphere to a mineral or biological atmosphere here. So the geophysics, the entire geophysics of the system has to be considered. So it's not just some key ingredient here. It's the rule evolution and combined evolution of all these elements together that matter. And that is why right now we have trying to widen the field. It's not only a question for astrophysicists that is dealing with the nebular phase and will help you to find something about the atmosphere. You need to understand a lot about the geophysics here and about the chemistry of the atmosphere. So the problem is turned out to be a massive interdisciplinary challenge here. Certainly one of the more interdisciplinary domain you can think about. If you want to make progress on the origin of life, I'm afraid you will have to bring geophysicists and astrophysicists and physicists together if they to work together to find a solution here. So one more slide, please. Next. Now, one way to see that and what people understand right now is if you want to deal with life, you're dealing with two parameters, complexity 
and aliveness. There is a point when you build complexity and this complexity is making aliveness. Next, please. There is a point when you cross a threshold here, next, where you would decide that this is alive, but it's not an on-off effect. I mean, there will be a gradual um, development of the chemistry, and then there is a point where the chemistry takes over. You're not the boss anymore. The chemistry becomes the boss, and he's a sustainable uh, evolution here. Next, please. You reach what's called innovation by evolutions. So it's a Darwin process that at some point will start. But before you reach that, there is a lot of stage. And that's what we have to work and understand before claiming, discovering, earthing life on another planet. Next, please. Well, you have to combine four ingredients. Astrophysics will be key here and will drive the, this, this selection. Astrophysics even play a role later on in, in uh, evolution because we all know a major astrophysical event can reshuffle the evolution parameters, but it's still evolution dominated. So geophysics will, will kick off as well and has to be considered for the reason I mentioned before. At some point, you will build up the prebiotic chemistry and then you will start evolving. You will become a bit more complex. You will start to be considered to being alive and or alive, more alive, not fully alive, but more alive. And then the prebiotic chemistry should continue. You don't build life prebiotic chemistry. You need more and more. You need to, to build up the micromolecules, the proteins, all this and on and on and on, and then you cross this threshold. So I show this diagram to show you that asking questions about life is complicated. It's very complex. And in that case, there are certainly four disciplines that have to work hand in hand, plus the biology that comes at, at the end. And that's one of the major challenges of the field, but it's also a very exciting challenge of the field. So we can say that this very awkward discovery made 25 years ago of a strange planet is open up a window of opportunity far bigger than just understanding the planet formations. I think it enabled a very serious research work uh, that we had never dreamed before, which is looking at the origin of life and looking at the diversity of life in the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Didier. And uh, there are so many questions. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> and I was told that uh, uh, your session, the questions come in fierce and furious. OK, um, so we have to be very selective. <laughs> and, uh, I think uh, what you shared uh, reminded me of a nursery rhyme we sang all the time as a child. Even even now, I think we sing a twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I yeah. want what you are. And today's talk, you, you share with us the fascination of this exoplanet. And really, it, it is a revolution. It's changing the way we, we perceive the, what the universe is. And there are many, many questions. I have to be very selective because of time. Uh, I roughly group some of the questions into, into certain category. OK, for, for example, uh, this, these two, to me, are quite related. Uh, and here, aunt ask, why are the structures in the universe actually disk-like like a disc instead of spherical. In fact, one of the participants said that as a biologist, he couldn't understand why it is not spherical. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, this is thank you. Russell Santos' question: Are there any particular signatures that correlate with the presence of biological life in exoplanet? In other words, is there a signature? I mean, the way you look at the the, the exoplanet. Let's start okay. with this. Okay. The the first one is 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 a is a good question. That's exactly exactly the kind of uh, interesting debate we're having with my colleague of chemistry. What is obvious for a physicist may not be obvious for a chemist. Well, the reason why there is a structure is related to a, a very fundamental conservation law you experience in nature, which is called the angular momentum. So when you start rotating, then you have to conserve a quantity, which is the angular momentum. So the natural then effect is you have a privileged directions or special directions where there's not nothing much you can do, which is when you going along the uh, the motions. Anything which is perpendicular, or let's call it along the rotation axis, will be able to go free. So naturally, this material will fall due to the gravity. So two axes will be completely controlled by the angular momentum, and we have no other way that to keep rotating because they cannot do anything else. 
Well, the third axis will be free to do whatever it wants, and then the gravity will prevail and everything will fall apart. So the disk is the most natural consequence of any rotating body you have in the universe. And you right. find this structure in the galaxies, in the black hole accretion disk. It's a very generic structure. And in the case of the exoplanet, it's uh, called the protoplanetary disk, but that's very common. Mm -hmm. So the first one. So the second one is, um, what? Uh, could you just remind me, they look for what is the exact signature? What, what signature? I mean, when, when because in, in your talk, you talk about the possibility of finding life. So what is the signature they are looking for? Yeah, so I think the, the idea here is, um, well, we look at a planet, uh, forgot life into the planet, um, you expect to detect the physical pattern of that planet or the physical signature of this planet, which is essentially the geodynamical balance that is being built in the planet. The planet is, is really a, a complex entity where you have material inside, material being ejected, interacting then with the gas outside, and the gas is interacting with the liquid that could be on the surface, and the liquid is interacting with the uh, going deep into the inside. So it's very complex systems. We have a famous uh, recycling. I mean, the recycling, we're all talking about the CO2 these days because we have completely, we're changing the CO2 slow recycling mechanism of our own planet. And each of the planet you can identify or the planet works. So assuming you understand that, which means you do, you have a lot of information on that planet, you may find out what's called the, um, strange data, uh, awkward data. And what is really awkward, uh, if you look at the Earth, is the fact there are so many oxygen. Yep. So the fact there is so many oxygen is a puzzle. So you cannot explain so many oxygen in combination with other gas that we have in the system by the uh, only the effect of the planet. You have to, uh, to conclude that there is something else which is adding uh, an additional element. And this additional element on Earth is life. So as soon as life kicks start, life in a way becomes part of this balance with the planet. And, and it's time to change the rebalancing and to rebalance the whole system. So we try ideally to find this. So by studying planet, we hope to find slight deviation from what you would expect from the soul dynamic of the geophysics. That's why we need to understand the geophysics of a planet to conclude right. if there are life on that planet. Yes. Well, uh, there are two questions which are interrelated. And uh, one of them is Mark. Karaskol, who actually said that this is a grand finale, is really a, a great talk to end the series. As I told you, beginning, right? The best <laughs> at the end, right? Thank uh, you. But, but he throw in a question which is all linked to what Yong Li uh, asked. Uh, they are related, they are technical question. How do you know that the methods we currently use in determining the properties of the exoplanets are accurate? Okay, because I think uh, a little bit of skepticism there, and, and also because people are curious, they want to know. How do you know? Do you do a control to say that our solar system, the sun, is like a controlled environment? And this is also linked to Yong Li. I think Yong Li's question may need hours of lectures. But he brought up this thing that is uh, uh, the role of the space telescope, the exoplanet observatories, and so on. Because you did say, and you start in your, in your talk, saying that there are different technology involved. So maybe you want to highlight a few key technology. But first question is, how do you know it's accurate? Well, I, I think, I think that there is always a limit to the accuracy we can get because uh, it's not infinite. So, so the law of physics are assumed to be valid everywhere in the universe, and we have no reason to believe it's not the case. So, so we can measure some, some, some parameters extremely well when it's easy, some of them are more difficult. The, the art of the science is to be realistic and to assess what is known as to be the error margin on every parameter we, we are getting. And if you pay attention to some, some of my diagram, I included some error bars. So I didn't want to talk about that. So, so we try to assess it at the best we can in the most honest way. Uh, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's a bit more difficult, but essentially all our findings are pretty accurate. I mean, to the extent of the, of the parameter we're dealing with. That, that on the first questions. Um, no, uh, what was the second one? Sorry, I forgot. It's, it's about uh, the different kind of telescope, this different kind of observation. Oh, yeah, technology. Well, I mean, uh, 
yeah. astronomy, I think, depends a lot on the progress of the technology. And we used to um, identify this period of time as a golden age for astronomy because we have inherited a lot of technology. One of more dramatic improvement in technology is when we got from the military developments the possibility to use infrared detector. It's commonly used for military purposes, but when the Sony astronomers started to look at this, they saw a completely new universe. So we're trying to use a lot of technology. Another one I'm, I'm using a lot is the fiber. I mean, the optical fibers. Optical fiber are the key for discovery of planet because we use the fiber to stabilize the light at the entrance of the instrument. I can go on and on and computers, all this. So we are really using it uh, as much as we can. And we are building right now a complete new generation of telescope. I mean, the telescope we're building today, the size of the mirror is 40 meters. I mean, it was have been impossible to imagine 20 years ago and think about Galileo using this tiny telescope a few centimeters. So right. technology is essential and technology goes hand in hand with blue sky science because you don't develop new technology and new material if you don't have brand new discoveries. So you need you need Einstein equations to make a GPS. And now we're using GPS to compute the exact location of our telescopes. You see, it goes hand in hand. It's part of a knowledge-based society. And building the knowledge is uh, is likely to then reward the society of some sort later on. Yes, good. I think uh, we have uh, a few more minutes to wrap up. But the, I'm going to combine three persons' opinion and question, which is related to exactly what you said earlier. Uh, Feng Xie and uh, Qi Xingkang, as well as Chris, uh, uh, Chris Ivan, they all talk about technology, and you know that technology advances your discovery and, and, and your studies. So they all link to this part about how do you go about promoting, especially getting government to invest. So do you think the government should continue to invest in such, and how do you convince them to to to, to invest, and how do you promote this astrophysics, astro science? Ast the, the exploration of other universe to the young people. So they are interrelated. One is government support, one yeah. is stimulating the young people to pursue. Well, so um, when I'm talking about my, my topic, I, I don't need to do anything special to uh, bring enthusiasts because I think the topic is enthusiastic. Everybody's yeah. enthusiastic. So I don't need to do very much. I just have to communicate. No, the government is interesting because the language I'm using usually is to just make sure they are fully aware of yeah. the society we're living is entirely dominated by science development. So the reason why we're living so old, the reason why we communicate this way, the reason why we travel this way is because it has been fundamental research. So this is the essence of the progress of our society. If we stop the research, we stop the progress of our society. No, you have to balance this with other need of the society, but it's an essential element for the survival. It's even more dramatic right now because we have this global warming and we understand that we have to do something and science is providing some answer into that. So I think the language is if you want our society to survive the future, you better invest into science, which means investing into the young generation of people because science is done by people. It's trying yep. making sure that every brain, every people willing to engage into science can do so. It means fixing some access to the knowledge in some part of low-income country, making yep. sure you don't bias to the gender, I mean, the allocation of resources, also the access to the knowledge-based um, studies. So all this is the kind of dialogue. I must say most of the government are pretty much aware of this. Uh, we have some hiccup. Sometimes they, we're going back. But globally, I think if you look at zoom out, I think everybody value the progress of, of the science. And with the full pandemic situation we're having right now, I think nobody challenging the interest of science. Everybody understand that we have vaccines right now for, for, this, um, uh, for, for, for what's going on right now. And it's because it has been fundamental research being done years ago. And if we don't understand the DNA and the RNA, forgot about building an, uh, an RNA-based vaccine here. Yeah. So I think this is all about this and it's about dialogue. No, there's another aspect as well is I'm trying to um, help supporting people that have science-based knowledge yeah. to invest time into politics to invest into government policies. I think the more science, scientific we have, scientists we have as yeah. part of the government making, making uh, decisions, the more it would help 
And I don't really like this disconnection sometimes that we do see between decision taken by government and the rational, um, um, I mean, knowledge-based um, decision that you would drive from just the science perspective. Right. Great. Professor Didier Carlos, if you were to look at the comments, you will look, you'll see people writing fascinating talk, most interesting talk, most wonderful talk. <laughs> I really you. want to thank you on behalf of the organizer. As I told you, right, ho leo tin tui. These are local terms. Huh? The best thing is found, and I think you live up to that. And uh, you brought us out of this earth. You went to outside so far, far away. We look at the future possibilities. Like a few of them said, when they were young, they thought it was just science fiction, and they're seeing reality happening now. So thanks to you. Thanks to you for your great work, your discovery, and thanks to your most inspiring sharing with us. Thank you very much. And again, thank you, very much thank you for participating. Stay safe, keep calm, and keep looking up. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.